Okay. Great. Well, welcome everybody to another distinguished speaker in the series for the Network for, for Economic and Social Trends. And um, Leah is going to do the land acknowledgement and then Laura will introduce our speaker for today, Jordan Mansell. I would like to acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenape Walk and Chinunctin Nations on lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous people, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we are and can each in our own way try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Laura, would you like to introduce Jordan, please? Yes, absolutely. It is my great pleasure to introduce one of our NEST uh, postdoctoral fellows, Dr. Jordan Mansell. Uh, I've, I've had the honor of knowing Jordan for many, many years now, um, largely because he's a product of my department as a master's student, but we he went on to the other um, the other part across the pond where they have a London, and he uh, got his degree from Oxford. Uh, where he did politics in a very different way than uh, our department used to do it. Uh, we're moving in this direction now. And he is an, an expert at combining political psychology and biology with politics. And essentially, when I want to think about how a brain works, I think about asking Jordan. Um, and so I'm very excited to have him here with us today and presenting some of his work. He's also an associate editor with uh, Politics and Life Sciences, which is a very innovative journal that brings these things together um, in a very cutting edge way. That's definitely a new direction of uh, political science is going. So today Jordan's going to be talking to us uh, about does emotional reappraisal reduce prejudice? We've had lots of conversations on this and I, and I look forward to hearing where his thoughts are right now. So Jordan, if you would like to proceed. Yeah, well, thank you very much for uh, this very flattering uh, introduction. Uh, I'm going to begin by just making sure you can all see my screen here. Um, is that correct? You can all see my screen. You can't see my notes. I can't see any of you right now, so I fixed that. Great. Uh, okay, so the project I'm talking to you about today is called it Does Emotional Reappraisal Reduce Prejudice? Uh, so I'll begin first by thanking Vicki, thanking Nest, thanking Laura for inviting me to present this project. Um, what I'm going to present today is part uh, of a larger project. Uh, it's the, the pre data collection research design. Um, we're currently waiting for, you know, ethics approval, uh, and we're already planning to make some revisions to the project. So any constructive comments, feedbacks, and suggestions you have for, for myself and my collaborators are welcome. Uh, just real quickly, in addition to myself, uh, Professor Amanda Friesen in political science here at Western and Professor Matthew Turgon at Western are also collaborators on this project. Um, let's see if I can just advance my slides here. Uh, great. Uh, so really quickly, just an outline of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about the research objectives. We're going to talk a little bit about the theoretical approach, the theoretical model um, that we're going to use. We're talking about our hypothesis, our hypotheses, and then we're going to focus on the experimental intervention we're going to, we're going to administer as part of the study. And at the end, we'll have opportunities for, for questions uh, and discussion. Please ask questions. Uh, do I, I'm happy to discuss any details, things that are omitted. Um, I'll note there that um, we have a 30 page research design which is written if you want more detailed understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing it you know please feel to reach out to me we're happy to share this document um i guess i'll ask you to notice you know we do invite criticism of the project and our approach uh, we just ask that you do so politely we understand that prejudice is a sensitive topic um it's personal for a lot of people uh but to have an open discussion i think we also need to be professional about the, about the topic um, it's also important that I acknowledge the supporters of this project. So we have support from um, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, 
And we also have support from the John Templeton Foundation. And in particular, the Templeton Foundation has been extremely generous with its resources, um, both in time and financial resources to really drive this project home. So we're very grateful for that. Uh, I also have to acknowledge, acknowledge we have a very large research board, a collaborative board, to help us make informed decisions about why a particular question or method is, is, is the best in the context. So I have to acknowledge Alison Harrell, who's at UCAM, Victoria Essence, who's obviously here at Nest, James Gross, uh, who's in the psychophysiology department at Stanford, Robert Hinckley, who's at SUNY Potsdam, uh, Valerie Ann Mayo, who's at the University of Laval, Sukhvinder Obi, who's in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience and Behavior at McMaster University. And we also have an NGO partner, uh, which is the Mosaic Institute, which is a specialist in anti-prejudice policy uh, and uh, community work. So really quick here to go over objectives. What I mentioned, what I'm going to talk about today is just part of a larger project. Uh, in part one, which is not the focus of our discussion today, uh, we're going to investigate how the regulation of emotion relates to prejudicial attitudes. When we say regulation of emotion, it's not just the emotions you experience in response to effort members, but what you do with these emotions, how you act on these emotions. Um, and in particular, we're interested in an emotional regulation strategy, what's called expressive suppression, where individuals hide their emotions from the outside world. Uh, we're going to assess this relationship using a facial image task with visuological assessment. That's where we're going to get the idea of what people do when they do people experience negative emotions to outgroups and then what they do with these things. In the second part of this study, we're going to test an anti-prejudice uh, intervention involving a different kind of emotion regula regulation strategy called positive reappraisal. So that's what we're going to focus on more in the second part of the presentation today. In part three of our, of our larger project, we're hoping to use our results to make better anti-prejudice policies. We're also going to administer a six-month follow-up to see you know, if our intervention you know, works after, after a time lag or a time delay. Um, okay, so theoretically, what are we doing here? Well, in this project, we're taking the perspective that there are many pathways to prejudice, and we're using what's called the effect and regulation model. And the idea here is that individuals vary on their sensitivity to external stimuli, right? There is an established relationship between how sensitive you are emotionally when you experience and interact with outgroups and prejudice. Uh, this, is a, this is a negative sensitivity. Uh, so it correlates with things like stress, anxiety, um, disgust, uh, and it's well established. Um, it's been, we've had research going back decades. What's important here is this is, this is, not, a probable, this is not a deterministic relationship. It's a probabilistic relationship. So, you know, the greater likelihood that you experience a strong emotional response to the child groups, the greater likelihood that you're going to have prejudicial attitudes. And we know this relationship does tend to generalize across ethnic and cultural groups. Uh, there's a lot of work on this by Josh Tiber, who's at the University of uh, the Netherlands. Uh, and we know that you know, the ethnic diversity of the population you're in, um, how socialized you are, it only partially moderates this relationship. So the takeaway here is it's a, the relationship between affective sensitivity and prejudice well established, it's not a fad. Um, I think something something else to add here is it's it really highlights you know the importance of considering prejudices is, is an interaction between you know, individual differences in psychology, but also differences in socialization. And the significance here is is in terms of causal expression, this matters because it helps, it determines you know, how we mediate our actions, what takes, what steps we take going forward, the kinds of advantage prejudice programs we design and implement, and obviously then that's going to impact on how successful we are uh, at combating prejudice in society at large. Okay. So why does effect? So so why do we care about effect? What's going on here? So. Given this is the relationship between effect and prejudice, this isn't the end of the story. We have another why question. And the reason is simply is that, well, humans aren't passive emitters of emotions. Humans have the capacity to, to, up, to regulate, update, or change the emotions they experience. Um, what's called the appraisal model of emotions so is an emotional process where you perceive an event as a perception phase. There's an evaluation phase to an action. Uh, you determine if, if it's good or bad. And there's an action phase. And during this action phase, we become consciously aware of our emotions. We have the opportunity to initiate different kinds of strategies and processes to interact or change you know, how, how we feel. If you're a political scientist, 
might be familiar with the idea of upregulating and downregulating emotions. This is a bit of an outdated understanding of how emotions work and how they come from, but conceptually, it's, it's relevant to what we're doing. Um, of course, the implications is there's no determinate relationship between affective sensitivity and negative emotions and prejudice. Um, there needs to be some kind of intervening process, right? Um, what's interesting here in, in Canada and, and many Western societies, we, we have strong norms and public messaging uh, that prejudice and discrimination are wrong, right? And we have external pressures to people that they should regulate their attitudes and behaviors. Uh, so we're at least partially socialized that prejudice and discrimination uh, are not good things. But despite these pressures, there's, there's still a fair amount of prejudice and discrimination going, going on, going around, even in the context of the Canadian society. So all this together, it suggests that there's some kind of intervening process, right? Something else is going on that we're missing here. Um, so our theory here is that individual differences in the regulation of motion will explain differences in discriminatory attitudes and threat sense of individuals. So individuals who experience strong negative emotions when you enter acting out groups, but who also suppress their emotions, who regulate their emotions in a maladaptive way, but more likely to have these attitudes, right? Um, so one of the strategies we're, we're most interested in here is something called expressive suppression. Uh, expressive suppression is a general regulatory strategy, uh, and it's generally considered to be maladaptive. It's, it's associated with a host of negative psychological consequences, um, it's widely associated with depression, anxiety, stress, and hedonia, the inability to experience positive emotions, and, and more recently in social aggression, especially among young people and young children. Um, the reason being is, is why, and why is this interesting? So one of the things that happens when we suppress our emotions is we're, we're delaying the negative experience. And we're delaying a process called extinction, the ability to move from a negative experience to a positive experience. It also has the effect of sort of priming your nervous system to experience a larger negative experience in response to a subsequent event. So we could, you can imagine you're interacting with someone who's in that group, you're, mar you're marginally uncomfortable, you're trying to suppress this emotional response to not let an individual who are observing you know that you experienced something negative. But in doing so, you're priming your nervous system to have an even larger response as the interaction continues and Psychologically, you're delaying this negative experience. It's the association between interacting with someone who's in that group and negativity, negative emotions. And so those two things together are a reinforcing signal, right? So that's what we think is driving this relationship. So, you know, theoretically, our hypotheses are as follows, right? We think individuals who experience strong negative emotions in response to drug groups and who suppress these emotions are more likely to hold prejudicial attitudes. The second hypothesis, though, is that we think that training individuals to constructively or positively appraise their emotional responses uh, instead of suppressing them uh, will reduce their expensive, expressive responses over time and consequently their discriminatory attitudes, right? So we're thinking of positive reappraisal as a tool to reduce prejudice, the idea being it's going to have downstream effects uh, both on the level of arousal and your physiological response, right? Um, what we want to emphasize here is we're not making excuses for why people have prejudice. Uh, what we are really interested in doing is identifying the psychological mechanisms that will allow us to design better, more effective anti-prejudice tools. Right, so we make that clear. Uh, in particular, tools that might be effective at, at, at applying broadly to, 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 to a large number of people across society. Okay, so really quickly, we talked about part one of this study, we're gonna do initial assessments. We're recruiting 380 individuals who are non-students. We're going to take part in a full cycle psychophysiological assessment, which, which looks at how much arousal they experience in response to that group, and then what do they do with that level of arousal, right? Do they suppress that emotional response? Uh, and does that relationship between arousal uh, and suppression, does that predict prejudice? That's just part one of the study, right? In part two of the study, we're going to, we're going to implement intervention. We're going to implement an eight-week program uh, involving weekly emotion uh, regulation exercise, teaching and training in, in, in positive reappraisal, right? Uh, quickly, our control will involve memory. There's, there's reasons for that, but we can talk about that later. What's important here is the objective of the intervention. Um, sorry, pardon me, one second. So the objective is to teach people who experience strong emotional arousal uh, to ethnic air groups to work through these emotions uh, differently. And the idea is we're trying to break the association between negative emotion, negative arousal, and outgroups. Um, 
what's I'll mention quickly, even if we, oh, excuse me, even if we fail to find the association between negativity, arousal, and suppression in part one, there's still a lot of utility to this intervention. Um, as changing individuals to change their thinking in a given scenario, we think more positively about, about others, uh, think about outgroups, still has the possibility to affect attitudes, even if it's not associated with general arousal. I'll, I'll mention that here. Um, but generally, our experimental goal then is obviously to engage in, in attitudinal change and ideally to engage in, you know, to adjust physiological responsiveness towards outgroups. Okay, so what is positive reappraisal? What does that mean? So positive appraisal is, is a, or cognitive reappraisal is a meaning-based cognitive reframing strategy, right? Psychologically, it's most associated as a method to manage stress um, and it's used in the treatment of anxiety, depression, antidonia, those kinds of states. Um, it focuses on finding personally relevant meaning and benefits in negative experiences, right? So the idea, this is the idea of, of positing opportunities for personal growth, personal development, um, in, in what would otherwise be viewed as a negative interaction. So you might think of an example of you've had a fight with a, with a loved one, and instead of thinking this as an argument, you begin to think of this as an opportunity for you to practice patience, um, to, to think of it as an opportunity for perspective taking, to better understand what your, your partner's perspective on the matter was. The goal again is to break this association, right? Between a negative event and an outgroup and, and, and just frame it in terms of an opportunity that's, that's more positive for an individual. Um, why does this matter? Well, there's a couple of reasons why this matters. And the first thing is just telling someone that they have this prejudice mindset and this is bad, isn't going to cause them to change their attitudes. It's, it's a well if anything, it's more likely to lead to a process called rumination. That is where an individual continues to fixate uh, on this negative relationship uh, and the negative emotions they assign to the other. Similarly, simply telling someone they're bad also has a tendency to reinforce the negative associations, which is more likely to continue the relationship between prejudice and outgroups. Um, and finally, just telling people that, that outgroups you know, are good, they might be good and you shouldn't think of them as negative, but that also doesn't do a whole lot to override the existing association, right? Uh, as a treatment, it's almost neutral. It doesn't have an immediate or, or, or immediately relevant uh, connection to the individual who has a specific set of attitudes. Um, right, so to overcome those associations, we need to do something that changes the mindset um, from a, one of a negative association to one of a more positive association, right? Okay, so let me give you an example of what a reappraisal treatment looks like. So sometimes emotions are challenging to manage. You try to remember a past situation where you said or thought something negative about a different branch or ethnic group. What about the situation made you speak or think in a negatively towards this group? So in this particular scenario, we're just asking someone to remember a scenario where they've done something that's negative. The second thing we're going to do is ask them to reflect and rethink about the, about the context. So still thinking about the situation, if you wanted to think differently about uh, this group, how could you change your thinking? For example, what lessons did you learn that might help you uh, avoid speaking or thinking negatively in the future? Um, very quickly, this is, quite, this is quite a general example. It's an early example of our study. What it's highlighting again is how can someone change their interaction, their experience, and reflections about a scenario to focus on, on, on themselves as being slightly more positive or having the opportunity for growth. So, what are the design considerations here? So there's a couple of design considerations in administering this study that sort of really matter. So an obvious problem with this, with this kind of experiment deals with non-compliance. Uh, so to manage non-compliance, uh, in each week participants, so non-compliance obviously being individuals who are high in prejudice, and perhaps don't want to complete the exercise. So to manage non-compliance in each week of the, of the experiment, participants are gonna complete two exercises. In the first exercise, we're, we're, we'll focus on you know, teaching reappraisal in response to a close familial or friend relationship. And in the second exercise, we'll focus on the interactions with the neck and that group. Um, the second thing to take away from this is, is the focus of the intervention itself. So you can't reappraise a negative emotion or a, a negative emotion to a positive emotion. You can't make someone think, think of, of anger as being happy, right? That's not how emotions work. So, the focus of the intervention always has to be on the relationship between the individual and the event itself, on the interaction and the perceptions of the interaction, right? Um, so in this case, thinking about we've had a negative series of negative thoughts about an outgroup, on response to some interaction, 
okay, let's change those thinking to focus on how themselves, they themselves might become more positive, more people more responsible, more have an opportunity to grow. Um, okay, so that's, so that's in conclusion, we're still making revisions on this project. Uh, we welcome any questions or comments. Um, some things may have been somewhat unclear here. I'm happy to go into more detail about these. If you're curious about our sampling methodology, if you're curious at all about uh, how we implement the study in time one, you know, please feel free to ask those questions. And I'm happy to engage in more clarification. So thanks very much. Thanks, Jordan. That's great. Um, I'm going to put up my little hand so then I can be my applause. Uh, so I, we have some time now for questions. So if you guys want to raise your hands, your little digital hands, um, I can see them. Um, Jordan, would you, you're still sharing your screen, Jordan, just so you know. Okay, I can stop doing that. There we go. <laughs> As in, I saw your Slack talk. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, any questions to start off the discussion? Okay, well, the first thing, maybe I can uh, take the I guess the right of, of having the floor a little bit to ask, um, have these kinds of studies been done in the past? I guess I'm kind of thinking about what kind of effect sizes are you expecting? I think you've done a good job of explaining um, what you expect people to do and uh, you know why you're doing it this way. Um, but have, has this ever been done before? Like, do you expect actual change, real change, lasting change? Is this a first, is this groundbreaking, et cetera? Yeah, so I can say this. So pre-2018, the only studies that have looked at this kind of mechanism looked at self-report measures of teaching positive re reappraisal in the context of conflict between Israeli, Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, and that was done with a sample of Israelis and Palestinians. What was absent from that study was any kind of physiological assessment. Uh, more recently, there have been studies looking again at self-report, looking at prejudicial attitudes in the context that was done in the Netherlands and uh, Finland or Sweden. Um, again, self-report for appraisal training, uh, self-report appraisal versus suppression or reappraisal training uh, on self-reported attitudes. Again, we do see a positive relationship. We do see there's a correlation between suppression and negative attitudes. And we do see this relationship is mediated by reappraisal training. In terms of effect size, um, the effects are generally fairly small, but the effects have also been limited by a number of, of sample demographic factors. Uh, so there's a large reliance on student samples, those kinds of problems. Um, the distributions of the, of, the, of the attitude measures themselves tend to be a little bit skewed to the left. So we're seeing, on average, the sample involves people who are low on prejudice. Um, off the top of my head, what, what, a, what a controlled effect size is doesn't come to mind, uh, but generally small. Thanks. Vicki? Um, I had a question about reappraisal because you were talking about how people's negative emotions, you can't get them to think of them as positive emotions, right? But often people just feel arousal, right? And they don't know what that arousal is. And um, I have a great story, which is I used to take a course where the prof would make coffee for us. And by the end of the course, like by the end of the time, I always thought I didn't like the course, but it was because I was so jittery, right? And so I was appraising that jitteriness as negativity, whereas it was just, he would make really strong coffee for us. It was a small class. And so honestly, people like that feeling of arousal, you um, label. And yeah. so is that part of what you're thinking about the labeling of arousal? Or is it really... So we, have, so we have to do both. In terms of the physiology, uh, we get arousal. We don't necessarily get valiance. Uh, it's really hard to capture valiance in our, right. for emotions. In fact, a cognitive psychologist will tell you that they can't capture valiance in most emotions. So in the context of, of, of the physiological assessment, we're interested in just the arousal, but the interaction effect with the additional measures of physiology, which is your, your, your blood pressure and which is um, uh, change in, in heartbeat. Uh, the standard error of a heartbeat. That interaction tends to reliably predict the suppression of emotion. So we can capture, yes, someone's aroused and they're suppressing their response. I can't tell you if they're negatively aroused. I can tell you what their attitudes are towards the individual. But generally speaking, 
it's less common for people to suppress positive emotions, but in the context, especially of being an out group, it's unlikely you'd have a big positive response and then try and suppress that response. Uh, so I'm less concerned about that as a confound. I can say what one of the things we will do during the assessment, we will ask for self-report, uh, positive emotion and negative emotion. It'll be two items, separate scales, because obviously you can experience both at the same time. Um, but it's, it's not something we're focusing on explicitly as, if it's, as, a, as a confound for experimental confound. Yeah, I wasn't thinking of it as a confound, but just your manipulation, making, making people reappraise whatever they're feeling as more mm -hmm. positive. As more positive. Um, can you elaborate? Would you are, you, are you suggesting we should put more emphasis on them thinking more positively? I think you should be focusing on how they appraise their arousal, whatever that arousal is. Um, how the arousal is. Um, it, so it's also something think, to think about anyway. Yeah, I was gonna say one of the challenges I found in, you know, like, uh, digging into the appraisal literature is other than Halperin's, um, you know, series of a lot of studies on, on Israeli-Palestinian interactions, a lot of the reappraisal literature is about self, like you experiencing discrimination or you experiencing sexism or you experiencing and less about others facing. And so that's one of the kind of questions we've, we've grappled with. We think it's a contribution we're making, asking people to assess sort of their emotions in thinking about other people rather. So so thinking about being a perpetrator rather than a victim kind of thing. Um, and I think because there's sort of a uniqueness to that, there is a difficulty. We don't have a lot to go on in, in whether there's gonna be success um, in having people do, and you know, the other, the, the various appraisal methods of, um, I'm forgetting the terms, I know Vicky, you know these, like of, um, Perspective taking versus perspective, right, yeah. right, yeah. Go ahead, Jordan. So, yeah. So let, 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 let me. I can give a bit of answer now. So one of the things we do during the administration is we ask individuals to to state briefly in open response, generally what they're thinking about, and then generally how they're thinking about it you know, as they're reappraising to try and get an idea of what they're thinking about. Are they doing the exercise properly, and then what the potential variance might be. Uh, so, so we're trying to record some of that information. We do this for every exercise. Uh, we also record in each subsequent week, week we've asked them how often do they do the exercises. Uh, we've been very mindful of report bias. We, we have some steps in place to avoid that, but we, we are mindful of the fact that if, if someone's saying, rephrasing the event by saying, well, this person is completely wrong, I've done nothing incorrectly, that would be a problem for, for the exercise. Uh, so we have to control for those kinds of events. Yeah, thank you. I will note another contribution that Matthew and Jordan and I, probably we've talked about this more than anything else, is what faces to include. Um, most of this sort of um, more recent anti-prejudice literature, anti-racism has been focused in the United States and between African-Americans and whites. Um, and so whether it's IATs or um, AMPs or, or different ways of assessing, um, I guess, like prejudice and so on. Um, there's less information. And a lot of it has to do with uh, uh, what we have in all of our samples, right? We have underrepresentation of lots and lots of groups. And so we can never draw any conclusions because it's underpowered, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is a, a problem in the facial databases, right? Is we, um, so Canada, you know, one of the, the larger, um, uh, um, non-white um, ethnic groups would be, you know, indigenous folks. And there isn't, whereas in the United States, that wouldn't even be a consideration. So they're never in any of the databases. Um, so what we're doing, and, and Jordan can speak more to the specifics, but we're choosing rather than, you know, our, our population is Middlesex County that does not have a large black Canadian population. Um, the people here who don't you know, who wouldn't identify as white come from a lot of different ethnic groups. So we want to try to represent the kinds of people that folks in Middlesex County would encounter. And so we have um, four, I think four or five different groups of folks and, and Jordan will, will give the specifics on those um, to, to sort of, again, make another contribution of how people think about outgroups they actually encounter versus maybe outgroups they never really see in their everyday life. Yeah, so it, it'll be four or five. We're, the only reason we haven't we haven't finalized it as five is we have to rely on a second facial database. There are some minor differences in how those faces appear. And we have to 
we have to get their data before we can be sure these things are comparable. Um, when you look at the images quickly, they're on different backgrounds. And it, it seems quite stark. But if you can change the backgrounds, it shouldn't be such an issue. Um, but yeah, so not only that, but we, we've taken great steps to work into our design you know, where ethnicity, ethnicity plays out and, and how this mechanism works. So most psychology studies, you know, it's a white sample with a few other individuals thrown in with maybe inadequate statistical controls. Based on how we're sampling here, we're reflecting demographic and data on participants in advance, including ethnicity. We're then able to control in the experimental designs. So if you're declaring that you're, you're someone who is South Asian or or Asian, you're going to view a treatment in which you're viewing only outward faces. Same same conditions apply for someone who's white, only outward faces. So we don't have to control for these things after the fact. Uh, it's built into the design, which is an, which is an, an important step and something that's perhaps been missed in, in past psychological studies. Um, we also have the opportunity then to look at different racial interactions. Um, we're, we're trying to be really careful about um, interactions by gender, face of the images, face of respondents. Uh, so we have the opportunity to disentangle those things. And it's, it's, it's worth pointing out, you know, we're hoping to do this study with you know, 400 participants. This is you know, three times the, the sample size of most psychological studies looking at this data. Um, so we think that's important. These measures can be very noisy. They are subject to different kinds of experimental effects, site location effects. Um, the personality effect of the researchers, they walk into the lab. Obviously, we try to control these things, but they, they do matter. Uh, so we're really hoping we're going to have enough robustness to deal with these issues um, in the design. Um, yeah. Other, other questions, comments, cries of anguish? Anything that was perhaps unclear? I have no cry of anguish, but I will say I, I want to see this work. Um, and I think it's, I, I really love the idea, but you know, you guys know that from me already. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to see how things go. And I really like the, I'll call it the Canadian twists or maybe the London, Ontario twists that you're putting on it. Um, because recognizing sometimes that our, our knowledge of how things work is based on very specific samples is an important correction. Uh, period, right? Um, but even more so, like not only just crossing the border, but also recognizing variation uh, rather than just a white sample and things like that. Anyone else want to weigh in? Have any questions? I see a couple of students. I'll put you on the spot, guys, in the sense as a group. <laughs> I'll add this is again, this is pre data collection, still in ethics. So if you have questions about the methods, the questions we're asking, things that perhaps we've omitted or should be asking, um, you know, potential biases, confounds. I have a question if nobody else is going to ask. Another question. Are you measuring ambivalence, uh, pre measure of ambivalence in prejudice? Um, because we know people who are ambivalent are more susceptible to changing their attitudes than people who aren't. And so a straight positive negative doesn't get at that, right? You'd have to measure positive and negative and then calculate ambivalence. And it's just another thing that might make your study more sensitive, just in case. <laughs> so we don't have a specific or designated measure of ambivalence. We do have positive and negative in response to a subset of, uh, of, of the images uh, administered post physiology task. Um, if you have a suggestion for a reliable or validated measure, you know, please pass that on. Um, but yeah, the expectation here is we'll have to look at both positive and negative together uh, and see, you know, generally extract the measure to see if there's, there's a correlation between these things. Um, so that was the suggestion that, that James Gross had highlighted in, the, in an early version of our, of our model. Um, I will say as kind of a point, maybe of interest, because there are some students on here, you know, the way that we're tackling this, there's a lot of moving parts to this study. Um, it might even be too ambitious for only $100,000. Um, we'll see. Uh, but we are intending, so right now we're going through the ethics process. Um, Jordan has been sending, Matthew and I, um, how many Qualtrics surveys do we have at this point? 15? 18? If you can counter pilot, piloting, we're over, over two dozen. Yeah, so just all of the different waves and all of the different, um, yeah, so it's kind of a large undertaking and we're excited to include 
Um, I see Hugo's on this call. He intends to be part of our project, um, include a lot of students um, as we begin the data collection and so on. Um, but we're also in the process of, you know, we want our first paper or we're trying to make our first paper a registered report. So we're going to submit um, a registered report, pre-analysis plan that goes to publication um, uh, and accepted before data collection at Nature Human Behavior. Um, so we're in the process of, of writing that right now. That's, that's kind of the idea for this first physiology piece. Um, and then, uh, yeah, from there, we, yeah, we're, it's, it's been a fascinating process to sort of scaffold out how you do a project like this um, with the number of, of people involved and, and so on. So um, hopefully there'll be lots of good learning opportunities um, for us too. So I'll just I'll quickly thank Matt for passing on this measure of ambivalence here. Any other comments? As Jordan said, comments, questions, concerns, you know, things you're pulling your hair out about, et cetera. Anything was unclear about how I defined reappraisal here? Because that was that was probably unclear. Do you want to review it, Jordan? Is there anything in particular? <laughs> if it's not unclear to you, I don't know what needs to be reviewed. Um, but, you know. Here's a question, Jordan. Yeah. So one thing that we kind of went back and forth with is the prime of asking people to reappraise a situation where they responded to a member of an out group that maybe wasn't the best response. And we kind of went back and forth. Do we want to ask them in the last month? Um, in the last year, their lifetime, you know, like, I think each of us can probably remember a time where we said or did something that like, to this day, we regret, um, even if it was in middle school or something like this, right. And so this sort of timing around what we want them to reappraise, like, is it valuable for them to reappraise something they said in seventh grade? Um, or do we want it to be more recent? Um, and so if anyone has any sort of um, comments about like the, um, how to give people a timing frame um, in the prompt. That's something I'm interested in. We assumed that the, the most salient thing would come to mind in regard independent of time frame, but that might be the best way to go about doing it. Laura, you, you. Yeah, uh, no, I'm just, I was thinking along those lines. I was speaking to my class this week about political scandals and we were talking about Trudeau's um, blackface scandal. And in particular, actually, <laughs> Noah was in that class, right? And as we were talking about it, one thing that came to mind is the degree to which you could say, oh, he's grown up or, oh, he's changed or it's different. And so when you're saying something about middle school, Amanda, right, we are thinking back, well, you know, you're not the same person you were in middle school. And it's really hard to chastise your younger self for something that maybe you didn't know better, you did. Um, but the behaviors of your current age category, whatever that might be, might be more relevant. So I don't have a perfect solution here um, because I'm not positive the age ranges of the individuals you'll be dealing with. But to think within a time period of one to two years where they're unlikely to discount the previous event due to youth or whatever may be useful. Uh, Noah, did you want to weigh in? I had, a, I had a question, I guess, kind of differently related, not necessarily related to that specific point. Um, I was just wondering if there was anything like about perhaps like mis uh, misidentification, like people who, because there can be cases where people might act racistly towards people, but there could also be kind of conflicting um identifications and, and why they're doing that and i just wondered if there was like anything about like are they identifying people as the correct kind of group or are they miss is that kind of uh, controlled for as well yeah so that's an interesting question i would say it's not necessarily something we've, we've, we've thought about directly in the design but it ends up being controlled for that's a weird way to say it um so again, we're going to assign people to treatment based on their self-reported identity. We're being careful about individuals who do have multiple identities and assign them to conditions where they're not going to view necessarily confounding identities as much as possible. Um, what matters most for us is not necessarily if they've categorized correctly or incorrectly. Uh, are, they experiencing, are they experiencing arousal in response to this image? Um, so if they've gotten this wrong, that isn't necessarily a problem. It's to the experience response. Are they suppressing this reaction? And this has happened, is that interaction between 
arousal and suppression? Does that predict the attitude? Um, the separate question of, of miscategorization, yeah. It, it's likely a lot of individuals who had this experience are engaging in miscategorization, but I don't think it's gonna undermine the results. Uh, if anything, it'll, it'll just show up as being, the, it, it will, yeah, it, it won't be an issue. You Does that make sense, Noah? Yeah, yeah, I think it makes sense. I guess, um, and this is kind of like, maybe anecdotal, but I've, I've had experience with, with relatives who have like, you know, thoughts that are outdated and, and likely racist, but, or, or like discriminatory, but it's also a lot of it's baked in like not properly understanding how people like of different ethnicities identify and things like that and not properly understanding how different, you know, minority groups or, or ethnic groups um, are categorized and how they're not like, you know, all the same, I guess. So that was just where my question was coming from. But I think I think what you said kind of made sense that it doesn't maybe matter as much in that specifics because the actions are still discriminatory or or would kind of fit into the kind of reappraisal and the programs that you guys have outlined. If I can give a better response to your question, I would expect that our this, this interaction is, is likely to predict people who miscategorize. Um, that's a better way to give the answer to that question. Uh, Hugo had a question. Okay, um, I just wanted to add up to Noah's point because uh, I think it was last week the Distinguished Speaker Series from NEST had uh, professors Keon West and Katie Greenland, and they talked about how this the definition of what is discrimination kind of shifts according to some psychological predispositions and the kind of context and group uh, you're inserted in. So for example, for white men high on social dominance orientation, they were very likely to say that a broad range of attitudes were not discriminatory uh, against uh, outgroups. Whereas when it was related to them, the definition of discrimination became very broad and lots of attitudes were considered discriminatory. Um, so I was wondering, um, do you expect the, the emotional reappraisal uh, training to have an impact in these social dominance orientations? Like, uh, are these people gonna feel less likely um, to have a narrow definition of discrimination? Are there, do you expect that this training is gonna make them empathize with a broader range of situations that could be considered discriminatory? So that is a really interesting question, and I mean that sincerely. So I'll say this first: is I would so if you think about discrimination and prejudice, racism, you think about is, it, is it the hostile dimensions and like the benevolent dimensions. And so I would anticipate the arousal model we have will best predict more of the hostile dimensions than the benevolent dimensions. Um, in terms of SDO is a hard measure. There's an ongoing debate about whether or not SDO captures parochial uh, individualism or selfishness or captures preferences for, for group-based hierarchies. Um, that, is, that, that is an unsettled debate. Uh, in terms of I'm trying to think of how I would answer your question here. So I understand it's, it's kind of rough. <laughs> yeah, it goes, it's, it's, it's how is this measure going to relate to selfishness? And the expectation here is that individuals who are high in this arousal, it should be significant even after you control for selfish behavior. I'll put it that way. Uh, we expect this measure is doing something differently than selfishness. Um, we would expect it to be doing something differently as well than a, just a preference for a group-based hierarchy. Um, the, 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 there's an effective dimension going on here that's independent of just sort of a zero-sum competition. Um, so we're really drawing more heavily on the literature from cognitive psychology, which deals with how do you respond to threats in your environment, whatever those threats might be. It could be disgust, it could be stress, it could be anxiety, it could be with anxiety. Um, those kinds of measures, one of the things we try to look at and control for here, are our, 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 our control is for how do, you deal, how do you deal with stress and control of stress in your daily life? Um, how do you deal with anxiety? Are you someone who's prone to these conditions? Do you, do you employ ineffective or maladaptive strategies to regulate stress, anxiety, threat in general? Uh, so those kinds of measures. Uh, so, I, so I don't think we have a measure of selfish behavior in the study. Um, I don't know if we're going to include one, but they should be independent of one another. Well, I think it's actually a really interesting question. Like my mind is just spinning, thinking about 
um, you know, sort of the order of, you know, do people with social dominance orientations develop prejudice or do people with prejudice develop social dominance orientations, right? And I, I would suspect like most things it is reinforcing, right? Um, and thinking about, so one of the other interesting parts of, of social dominance orientation is people can have these ideas even if they have zero experiences in their everyday lives. And so like when we're asking people, think of a time when, so if, they've, if they have a prejudice toward an out group that they've never met, they're not really gonna be thinking about that time unless, I don't know, I'll be curious what we find. Maybe some people will say, I was in a public place watching a television and someone came on from this group and I yelled something. I don't know, maybe we'll get some things like that. Um, but I'm sort of curious about, yeah, I think, a, um, you know, and this gets into like how contact theory does or doesn't affect these things too, right? So, so whether prejudice persists when people have you know, more people in their everyday lives that they can have prejudice against or people they've never even met, right? So the specter of anti-Semitism that exists in a lot of, like I think about the anti-Semitism that's happening in Nebraska where I grew up and there's like four synagogues, maybe two um, in all of Nebraska, right? But there's these people who are painting swastikas and, and doing all this stuff where they probably have never met a Jewish person. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think this, these are all really open questions and, and Hugo, as a graduate student who's working on our project, might be interesting if you wanted to, we could be talked into adding some of these measures um, if you wanted to explore sort of how SDO um, interacts with some of these other things. Thank you, that's very interesting. <laughs> that was a great idea. And it's also unfortunate because I'll say Hugo and, and to Vicky, last week the experimental group met at the exact time of that talk. <laughs> <laughs> and so the overlap was unfortunate um, because I think that's a really excellent um, avenue to think about. Any other questions from any of you in the audience? And I think this is a very obviously exciting project. Um, do you, so we're waiting on ethics and then you're going to revise ethics, which means you'll be waiting on ethics again. Um, do you have a, a timeline uh, other than that, end of summer, fall? So we, we, we hope to begin our pilot testing in, in May and June. Um, one of the things about physiology, you have to test your sensors. Our sensors have been sitting in a box for, for two years because of COVID. Uh, you hope that they worked, um, but you have, to, you have to double check. Um, we need to train our train our A's. So we're hoping to do that. We're hoping to begin building our subject pool uh, in July, and then actually start doing you know, real data collection in August. That's that's the goal. Um, but we have tons of opportunities for RAs because again, daily daily data data collections. Um, if there's, I, mean, I don't think anyone here is an undergraduate, but if they were undergraduates, the university has a work study program for undergraduates, which you'd be eligible for as well. So. Um, yeah, I'll say thank you very much for, for the feedback and discussion for everyone who came out. Um, I really appreciate it. Vicki, do you want any closing remarks, Vicki? If nobody oh. else has a question. Thank you, Jordan. That was a great talk and lots of things to think about. And uh, I agree that SDO has to be put in there somewhere, but I, I love that measure. So. Do you use the 2094 version or the 2016 version? Um, I vary, but I now measure both components separately. Well, I do the factor analysis to see if there's two factors, basically. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, so. Anyway, thank you for a great talk. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jordan. We appreciate the presentation.